Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today I'm doing another Star Wars video discussing uh, the original trilogy and the Imperial equipment, which is which is getting a lot of criticism from prequel kids who seem to think that all the Clone Wars era stuff was better in every conceivable way, and all the Imperial stuff is terrible. Uh, you know, so I'm gonna. This is another video really defending Imperial equipment. The Empire did nothing wrong. Uh, that's probably what I'll call the series. I'm going to get demonetized for that, but I stand by. <laughs> um, so today I thought I'd talk about the Tie Fighter, and l not necessarily so much defend it. I don't think it needs defending. It doesn't get the same criticism, but more contextualize the Tie Fighter and make sense of why it is the way it is and how it makes sense in the big picture scheme of things. Um, so really the pl there's two main reasons. There's a political reasons, or a big political reason, and a strategic reason. So I'll go into those. So I'll first start with the political reasons. So at the end of the Clone War, and these feed into each other, um, but so at the end of the Clone Wars, um, you have the Clone Army and the Clone Fighter Force, which is very, very good. They have their Arc 170s and their V-Wings mostly, as well as uh, Z-95 headhunters, but all good fighters, uh, but they're all very expensive. Now, that's not a huge problem, because the clones themselves are expensive. You don't w really want to put clones in really cheap, ru rubbishy fighters, because clones cost a lot, and you don't want to risk them, so, you know, it's worth protecting them and giving, and also, they're well trained. They're trained which means that they um, they can actually use this stuff well. Um, but, at the end of the Clone Wars, so we've just established, clones are expensive. Uh, at the end of the Clone Wars, there's a big, big galactic recession that's about to happen. Uh, the Republic, now the Empire, and the Separatists um, took huge, huge loans from the galactic banks huge loans, and, uh, well, the Separatists definitely aren't going to be paying them back, and, um, the Empire's nationalised them, so they're not going to pay them back, so a big recession is inbound. So, Palpatine has established his new order, and he needs to ensure that it's it stands, and if there's a big recession, well, that's not going to really work. That He's probably going to face immediate um, unpopularity within the core world as much as uh, in the Outer Rim. Um, so, he needs to bring economic prosperity. He also needs to address the problems that led to the Clone Wars in the first place, otherwise he'll have the exact same problem. He'll have these uh, mid-rim colonies uh, rising up and rebelling. So, what's his strategy? Well, his strategy is um, his well, his overall grand strategy, and this fits into that, is well, your populace doesn't the populace doesn't bite the hand that feeds it. What do I mean by that? Well, if they're working for the empire, they can't very well really rebel against the empire. So you need to get all these people. You need to get as much of the population working for the empire because they're not going to rebel against their own employer. They're not going to rebel against the people who are paying them and allowing them to put food on the table. So that's what he goes with. With that, he then starts, okay, that means decentralization, because previously the galactic economy is very centered around the core, and that, again, is what led to the separatist crisis to begin with. Um, so he needs to expand. It also then gives a excuse for further imperial presence in the further reaches, for expanding imperial presence. Um, so, in as such, uh, he's going to sort of go on this industrialization program of the mid rim. Now, this comes after the sort of the, the conquest of the mid rim, where they drive out the last separatist holdouts, and then they basically, Lothal is an excellent example. They basically just drop a uh, imperial base onto the planet's surface. Say, we're here now. Stick the flag, stick flag in the ground. And um, next thing, that, and then they start building factories. 
and they'll do that by just taking land, doing it as quickly as possible. Um, and it's like, oh, well, the, this is farmer's land. Well, it's fine, because you can work for us now. So, let's be clear, you're now employing people. Uh, all, and the other thing is also, they'll also be taking control of separatist uh, droid factories. Um, so they're going to be needing to do something with those as well. Um, but, kind of returning to those more agricultural worlds, those are the more common. Um, you've got all these farmers that you've now displaced because you've built a dirty great factory on their land and are digging up the planet for all the ore and everything. Uh, you need to give them jobs. And you want them to have jobs because they, they're, you want them to have imperial jobs because then you can better con kind of control them. Um, they're not going to rebel against you if you are their employer. Um, but at the same time, you can't really have them building really complex things. They're not really going to be up to building Arc 170s or uh, V-Wings or anything like that. Those are very complicated bits of machinery and they will require highly specialized parts. Um, parts that just aren't going to ex just aren't going to be available out in the mid rim. So the simpler thing to do, um, the more sensible thing to do is build is have them build something that they can easily build, and Tie Fighters fit into that. They're very modular by design by necessity, uh, and they're relatively simple because they are basically a set of vector thrusters, um, some so with some radiator wings. I don't know if those solar array wings are meant to absorb heat or disperse it. Um, but you have those vectored engines, uh, a cockpit, and some blasters. And that's really all there is to it. Well, some laser cannons actually, not blasters. Um, but that's really all there is to it. Uh, it's a pretty simple machine and can be pretty easily and speedily assembled and is probably much easier to build in old droid factories. Um, now that's purely speculation, I don't know if they did use droid factories to do that. Uh, there may well be m Legends material that says that they actually built other stuff, I don't know. Um, but so, from an economic standpoint, the TIE Fighter is an excellent means of, means of industrial employment. Now that, here's the flip side, and this now feeds into the strategic as well, is you're building the Imperial Navy. Um, it needs to. You're not using clones anymore. You're using uh, regular recruits. Now you can't train them for as long. So do you really want to trust them with something as complex and expensive as a headhunter or a uh, 170? Not really. You don't really want to trust them with that. Um, so you're gonna give them uh, TIE Fighters, and also because of how numerous TIE Fighters are, that creates more job openings, and again, the Imperial military, as much as the military-industrial complex, is a huge part of Palpatine's big employment scheme. Um, I mean, like, Han Solo has basically no qualifications, but he goes, he gets into the uh, Fighter Academy, so that tells you a lot um, about Basically, the Empire will take anyone. Uh, and because they'll take anyone, because they need employment. Uh, but at the same time, they don't want to risk loot these idiots, frankly, uh, trashing their very expensive fighters. So don't give them expensive fighters, they give them very cheap fighters. Now, this is where I get to the strategic thing, or the kind of the recruitment nature of it, the personnel thing. So, in my title, I said TIE fighters 100% skill. Because there's nothing in there, there's no complex machinery that basically improves the pilot's performance. It is purely down to the pilot on how good that TIE fighter performs. Now what this allows them to do, uh, the Imperial High Command, what this allows them to do is basically uh, they can weed out the good, the good pilots, the best pilots, the aces, or not weed out, but they can pick out the aces very quickly and very easily because basically they're the ones that survive. If you survive an engagement in a TIE fighter, you're probably on your way to becoming an ace. 
and then they'll trust you with something a little something a little bit better maybe they'll start trusting you maybe you'll get to fly a tie interceptor maybe a tie advanced maybe a tie uh defender uh which are all things coming through the pipeline um but that are so still use the same bits as the tie which is very good very efficient uh organizationally uh but a much higher quality and i doubt I doubt if things like TIE Interceptors and TIE Advanced and everything are built um, so much in the midrim. I uh, suspect those are more special. The more advanced TIE Fighters are built in the core uh, systems because they're less numerous and they do require more specialized and expensive uh, components. Basically, it's a program. It's an ongoing process of training, and you're getting out. your your kind of getting all the aces and making sure they have the best equipment and leaving the trash to the um or not the trash but you're not then wasting good fighters on people that can't use them which the rebellion do the rebellion waste fighters on people that perhaps aren't very good because they're just desperate for pilots and that's the be all and end all they did basically like Luke shows up they're like oh you wanna fly yeah okay yeah get in the next wing I mean there you go um um you know we've seen plenty of times you know um you know rebel rebel pilots don't necessarily make the best decisions and the only thing that really saves them is the X-Wing itself. Um, another thing is the draw of the TIE Fighter. They want to attract certain kinds of mentalities with TIE Fighter pilots. Uh, you, you you know in the in the real world, I don't know if if they have anything in the US, but in, in Britain uh, they we have the we have our Royal Marines commandos um, and the adverts are it's a state of mind. It's a state of mind and that goes for TIE pilots just as much. They want very specific states of mind. They basically want World War II Japanese pilots. They want, you know, people that are willing to just kamikaze or whatever, um, that are just completely fanatical uh, and devoted. The uh, the Tie Fighter is again a, it's it's attractive to that because it's just you. It's a hundred percent skill. It's you know. It, it, it's on the edge of technology. It, it, it attracts those real risk takers, those um, the real risk takers, the uh, the people you really wouldn't want to trust with expensive stuff. Um, but they're very good, and the best of them, the best of those kinds of people, can be trusted with expensive stuff. You can trust them with a tie defender or a tie interceptor. Um, and so, you know, and basically it's just a question of do they survive or not. So, I mean, <sighs> given that, the TIE Fighter makes a lot of sense for the Empire, and individually, TIE Fighters may be inferior. You may get a rubbish pilot in a TIE Fighter, and they may be inferior to a Rebel Fighter. Um, there's a lot of TIE Fighters out there that aren't so inferior and really do threaten uh, rebel pilots and the, thus you uh, end up there's a greater spread of skill in the Imperial fighter ranks um, you have very low skill and very high skill or in terms of the performance I should say um, you have some you have a greater overall spread whereas in the rebellion it's narrower because they're kind of limited by their fighters because their fighters dictate a lot of what they can and can't do unlike the tie fighter um, so that there's a big skill gap at the end of it I'm just thinking also in terms of um, another criticism made of the tie fighter is the lack of hyperdrive now I think I've explained that given given the Hyperdrives are very expensive, very expensive, and again, you don't really want to waste them on someone who doesn't know how to use the equipment properly and crashes it or whatever. Um, given that that's the case, it probably makes more it makes more sense with what the Empire goes with, which is basically just put them all on a hyperdrive capable ship, uh, like a Star Destroyer. Um, because A, it's probably able to mount a better hyperdrive anyway, like a class 2, and 
the ship is much, much, much safer and less likely to be destroyed than a TIE fighter is. So it's it's a good hedging of risk. You're still bringing an effect of firepower to the uh, to the battle space, not field, but battle space. Um, now you might say, well, yes, but they need to stop and unload all their TIE fighters. That's true, and I would say the Empire perhaps overlooked the aspects these aspects in its design, which is. The TIE Fighter is deployed from racks, so it doesn't need a conventional hangar. I mean, Star Destroyers don't really need conventional hangars at all. So, why do they have them? They probably should have, rather than what they have, which is basically you have the ventral hangar bay uh, from which the TIE Fighters launch, what you'd actually probably want is, along those port and starboard trenches, have gaps have gaps for TIE fighter tubes that maybe contain individually only a handful of TIE fighters but they're, they're launched from those racks and so they kind of come out the sides of the ship and then so they they deploy relatively quickly there's less of a traffic jam because it's dispersed along the entire surface area of the Star Destroyer uh, and there's less of a traffic jam they get in combat more quickly and they're there to defend the, the ship and then you might say, oh, well, Star, you know, TIE fighters, they lack capital ship. They lack the ability to take on big ships. Well, yeah, you do get TIE bombers. Those are available. Um, and they're good enough. Uh, if, your tie, if your TIE cover is any good, they should be good enough. And uh, in any case, you've still got the Star Destroyer. I mean, and that definitely will be enough. Um, the TIE fighters aren't meant to take on ships. Remember there's not really many, they're not really expecting many enemy capital ships, and if they are, then it's going to be the job of the Star Destroyer. Their job is going to be smaller ships, fighters, skiffs, that kind of thing. Um, so, it, it seems a bit of an irrelevant criticism. TIE fighters aren't meant to take on capital ships. It's not It's not their job. Um, but they are very good at their job, which is defending Star Destroyer, which is you know, serving as a defensive screen when used properly, when used properly, they can act as a very effective defensive screen. Um, they can just swarm a lot of enemy ships with sheer firepower. It doesn't matter that they they only have laser cannons. Um, they've just got such a torrent of fire incoming. At the same time, they're low risk. You're not going to cry if you lose a TIE fighter. It's very replaceable. And what does that mean? Well, it means one, one less guy on Imperial payroll. Um, and you know the ones that do survive well clearly they're very good and um, you know let's maybe look at promoting them um or maybe and you know one day um they'll become tie aces themselves and the tie aces <sighs> i mean let's not even talk about them because they're really they are just next level compared to pretty much any of the rebellion pilots they are uncannily good so I think if we take all that into account, uh, the TIE Fighter makes a lot of sense and is probably the best decision the Empire could have made. But so those are my thoughts. Uh, what are your guys? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you guys in the next video.